Hello, good morning, everyone. We will now start with the morning's tutorial. I'm Guillermo Sicileo. I'm a member of LACNIC staff. And we will start this morning with a tutorial on the use of RPKI and IRR for network operations. And Erika Vega will be joining me, who I now invite to Come up. Erika Vega, is, Erika Vega is a senior consultant in socio and an engineering manager at SIH Network. And together we'll be holding this tutorial, which is addressed at the use of RPK and IRR from this network of the users of the networks who need to use these services rather than a very technical presentation with the details. So shall we start then? Erika, you have the floor. So, good morning, everyone. Today's tutorial is quite brief. We'll be here for two hours explaining the users, uh, the, the use of this mechanism, and this will be supplemented with the tutorial after the break, which begins at 11 a.m. So that tutorial will have to do with the resource of the use of one of these mechanisms, which is RPKA validation in delegated mode. So now let us look at the general features of the two mechanisms. Let us have a look at the use of RPKI in the hosted mode in detail, and we'll be complementing this with a tutorial we have later on. So welcome, everyone. And it would be great if the people who are there at the back can come closer so you, we can see you better. And the idea is that you freely take advantage of the opportunity to ask questions so you can use the microphones and make this an interactive session. So if you can come up, it will be much better. So let us then say why it's necessary. Why it's necessary, and why do we talk about uh, to talk about these issues? Why do we talk about them? And so we are going to start telling you about uh, the most uh, typical routing incidents. We have, well, the first that we're going to discuss is route hijacking, that is announcing prefixes that we are not authorized to announce. And this may have two reasons. One may be intentional, while the other might be an error in the operation. So what does uh, route hijacking uh, mean? It's announcing something that we shouldn't announce or that our uh, AS is not authorized uh, to uh, announce. Uh, for instance, here we have a client that wants to access uh, the address 2001 db 8 ff slash 40 and if you look at that network, uh, that slash 40 is being announced through the autonomous system 65 uh, uh, 510. And that announcement reaches uh, 65502. Uh, they receive the network from the two autonomous systems it's connected to, uh, 65510 and 55509, and that is announced to 65501. So 
When the client wants to reach the uh, um, uh, uh, 65, uh, 520, it will take uh, the routing and uh, will uh, will go through uh, these two uh, ASNs. Now, what happens if uh, 65509 that was IPv4 announcing IPv4 only route starts uh, announcing a prefix uh, of the same network 2001 TB8 FFO, but instead of a slash 40, it announces a slash 48 that is much more specific. You know that the more specific bars. Uh, beat the least specific. So when uh, 65509 announces that, it will reach uh, the uh, uh, 65502. It will put it in its table and it will have a um, preference. And uh, in turn, it will pass it to 65501, and the same thing will happen. So when this customer wants to reach this address, it will follow this path. So what happens here is precisely uh, this, instead of going to the autonomous system that had to announce 65510, it will go to 65509. And this is as simple as the fact that 65509 may announce a prefix and uh, is accepted by its upstream upstream uh, providers or its peers or the RXPs or uh, whoever is acting as a peer. So just by announcing a more specific prefix, I'm already hijacking uh, all its traffic and uh, having it go through my autonomous system. There's no way I can re-inject this into the internet. And I could be organizing traffic or I could be um, putting a, uh, a, a website uh, other than what was expected. That's the sort of uh, problem it leads to. It's quite a common routing incident. And as I said, it may be intentional or because somebody makes a mistake in the operation. And actually, the latter is the most frequent. The other type of accident is route leaks. That's quite common. These are violations to the routing policies. So when we have prefixes learned from our provider, and uh, we announce them to other provider, and we uh, that is also a, a source of trouble. We so we receive it from our transit provider. We announce it to our peerings, or the other way around. We what we receive of our peerings, we announce it to another peering. So the, we are actually. Um, not respecting the rules. Usually when we learn prefixes from our providers, we only have to announce them to our own clients, but not to the peerings, nor to the IXPs or other providers. So in this example, for instance, 65, uh, um, 65, uh, 536 and uh, 537 have appearing, and each of them announces their own prefix to the internet. For instance, 65, 511. 65, announces 2001 DB8 10 slash 40, and 65, 537 2001 DB8 20 slash 40. So that's okay. And in turn, they announce those two prefixes. Now, the problem comes when, for instance, if 65537 receives the announcement of uh, 65536 with no pre-configured uh, filters, it will announce it uh, um, uh, upstream and it will produce a leak. For in this case, for instance, it's re-announcing a prefix of the same length. It might not be such a problem, but if this prefix were more specific, it would you would be filtering a more specific prefix. This is not a route hijacking because I'm not redirecting it, but 
I'm just republishing the same thing with the same autonomous uh, system of origin, and so the same source, uh, ASN. So that's part of the traffic that goes to 65536. Instead of going directly, it could go through 65537. If I repeat, if this were a more specific prefix, then it would be going the wrong way. Now, this uh, just to give you the context, the background of how many incidents there are in the region, and you can see it here in this, these charts. This, the chart to your left is showing what happens globally, and to your right, it's what happens in uh, Latin America in the Lacnec region, uh, Latin America and the Caribbean. This is the Manor's Observatory. And uh, at the bottom, you have, well, the routes, whose routes have been uh, altered. And then you have the mis originations, then you have the route leaks, and then you have the Bowdoin announcements that shouldn't be there, the Bogan announcement that shouldn't be there. So, they are close to 2,000 incidents a month, um, a year. Um, in the LACNIC region, this goes from September 2022 and uh, uh, September 2023. That's a year, and it's the same period in LACNIC. So you see that there is no clear trend because it goes up and down. And there, well, in June this year, there was a peak. So there was a surge, but um, that's not something, at least um, manners statistics. This is based on this manner statistics, it's not improving much. So I already told you what uh, the most uh, usual routing incidents are. Now, what can we do to mitigate them? And here I'm going to give the floor to Erika so that she may tell us. Okay. Before we go on, let me remind you that we have participants connected via Zoom, and they're going to have you're going to have Q and A space, so you can send questions. So please use uh, that uh, space. So, let's go on with this part, some actions. What can we do to mitigate these incidents that Guillermo just mentioned? And something that we'd like to show you, one of these uh, actions of these uh, norms, the, the standards, is what we're going to start to use so that we can find the mechanisms that we're going to discuss in the tutorial today. So we have the standards, the mutual, mutually agreed norms for routing security, that's uh, manners. And these, these standards, these norms, provide key solutions to reduce uh, the most common routing threats, what we just saw. It's thanks to the common use of these norms that will manage to improve the security and reliability of uh, the global routing system of the internet improve. So remember that all these networks are interconnected. So whatever we discuss uh, in setting up our network has an impact on the networks with whom we interconnect and the other way around. What we announce, what we and we receive, they all may get altered. So these mutually agreed norms are based on collaboration among the participants and uh, the people in, uh, responsible for uh, the various networks. Now, how can you improve uh, this uh, 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 security and uh, reliability of uh, the entire system. Well, first of all, raising awareness and uh, promoting actions, using them globally. 
massively in uh, throughout the network so that all the network providers may be aware of the actions to knowing getting to know and promoting a collective accountability culture so that we may be aware that what we do in our network may affect uh, the rest so not only should we uh, um, uh, implement actions uh, to protect ourselves, but the other networks with whom I have connection agreements. As we use, uh, as we increase the number of users in the internet, we may also have the, the possibility to uh, for troubleshooting faster. So it's better if we coordinate together. So if we ever have any routing incidents, we can act quickly and we have that capacity in this industry that provides internet uh, services, these interconnection services. So we have the capacity to solve uh, these conflicts and these problems quickly so as to create an enhanced resilience. And we, can, we should also provide a framework. Today, we are going to focus on uh, the what is uh, meant for the ISPs, but the manners programs, these mutually agreed norms, have uh, different uh, programs for network operators, for uh, uh, internet exchange points for vendors. Uh, so we need to be aware of these programs and depending on which we participate in, we need to know what are the actions expected from us. So this is going to be a framework and some specific actions, many of which may be already underway. We may already be implementing some, but we have to know how to be part of this group. So this group, these norms are generated globally, and the idea is that each organization that has its own network uh, must know them and uh, they should be members of manners. This afternoon, we are going to have a meeting on this topic at the Platinum, uh, in Platinum Room at 2 p.m. if you want to learn about uh, the programs for this. But today, we are going to provide you information and all the actions that we're going to focus on and understand the RPKR, IRR mechanisms uh, and what you ha have to do to, uh, to these actions. Now, specifically, this is created to find solutions to three problems that we have regarding global routing. So to protect ourselves from problems involving incorrect routing information, or that we are receiving and that is incorrect and generates problems in terms of routing. Other solutions regarding IP traffic, uh, origin, and this is used uh, with malicious intentions, then this might have to do with hijack problems. And then also regarding coordination and collaboration between network operators so that we can have a way of rapidly communicating in order to respond to these incidents very rapidly and find rapid solutions. So this leads to this framework regarding routing. So if as an organization we comply with these standards, we will be able to focus on one, but many of the ones that we have over here, I think the majority of well, if as an organization we cover these types of norms, we can have routing security, for example, in order to better protect the customers. Compliance with this avoids all routing incidents in order to be able to deal with these issues, then to improve the operational efficiency of a network when establishing these exchange routes for the purpose of 
communication, of traffic that are better and cleaner. And this can be more organized in order to have security policies that can then provide more detailed information in order to figure out problem solving more specifically. And then this was created with the aim of identifying problems and concerns of companies. Each is free to generate their own routing uh, forms. And where you have the connections with your upstream providers and the content providers in the way you consider adequate and also having a general framework for all these interconnections. So all this will last to provide response to all the many incidents that might arise. Now here, we have the four types of actions organized for operators. There are four specific actions that have to be complied with. We have filtering in order to understand how we can filter the announced routes and the routes we receive, bearing in mind all these best practices, the prefixes that tell us what we shouldn't announce as a network operator and what we shouldn't receive, and also in terms of that global routing, things that have to be taken into account and filtered. And this in order not to affect other clients. Then we have the anti-spoofing part, which has to do with enabling validation of the origin address, particularly for those interfaces where we receive the connection with the external networks and so deal with all the IP forging and identity theft. Then we have the coordination part, namely maintaining the updated contact information, information of who's responsible for that network. So this needed only just be one specific contact, but also to have the entire information of the group that operates the network, like the logs and the SOGs, where you can wrap it who you can rapidly contact in the event of an incident that affects the structure or infrastructure of the networks that are connected. And then we have global validation. This part is the one we'll be focusing on today. This part of the global validation is about how to publish the data so that other networks can then validate how we are generating the information. And then if the routes we're generating are valid routes and also trustworthy. And much in the same way, we use the information generated by others in order to validate whether the information we receive in our network is also trustworthy. So we're going to focus on this part of global validation on this action of manners. And that there is where the use of these two mechanisms will be very valuable. We'll be focusing on this, on that IRR and RQKI namely. So now let us go into the more technical aspects and what these mechanisms are all about. We will see things in detail, how to use IRR and IPKI, and we'll have a couple of demos too. Now, what do we wish to achieve? Why do we need these mechanisms? When we have peering between two autonomous systems, like you have here, 65501 and 65502, if I am in 65501 and I pick up a peering of, with the autonomous system, I know that this is what I have to announce. 
because if it's my own network, I know what I have to announce outwards. So 65501 can apply filters to the announcements it does, and then decide which prefix it will announce and which autonomous systems. For example, 65501 has two autonomous systems which it provides transit to. So it knows which these are, they are its customers, so it would have to enable those, allow those autonomous systems. It can also apply filters for prefix for the AS path or for community. So it can decide what it will be announcing outwards, and this affects the incoming traffic. 65501 very clearly knows how to do this. Now, when 65501 connects with 65502 and wishes to apply filters for entry, because it will not allow just any announcement, we saw a while ago that if 65502 is announcing something that is not adequate, it will then detour the traffic. So I don't want in 65501 to have things announced that should not be announced. Now, how can I know with what 65502 has to announce? Who tells me? So 502 tells me, calls me and say, I'm going to announce that. Well, that would be, or they send me an email or send me a letter. And but there's nothing to back that. So 65501 has no way to determine what it has to learn from 65502. These autonomous systems you have on the right, we don't know what they are. How can I know that those are really connected to 65502, and 65502 then has to announce those networks of those other autonomous systems I have no way to figure that out and see if these are correct or not. So those are the things. And how do I find that out? Well, there are two ways. And this is where this comes in. How does 65501 know what 65502 wishes to announce? Or one is using IRR and the other is using RPKI. What are these? One are databases, external databases to BGP. BGP has no intrinsic mechanism for this type of information. So for that, they need to check this against external databases. So there are two ways to do so. One is through the internet routing registries, which are more somehow historical. They stem from the 90s. So they have been in operation for many, many years now. And then RPKI, which is more recent, and is a somehow more recent mechanism that tries to improve a couple of things regarding authentication. Now, basically, this is what we have to know. These are databases where the operators publicly declare which are the autonomous systems and the networks that will be publishing. That information, that external information will be used so that what they receive is correct. The, what they receive through BGP is correct. So the internet routing registries, as I said, have been in place for quite a number of years. There are a large number of IRRs. The most well-known is RADB. RADB replicates all the other internet routing registries. The internet routing registries, there the organizations define the routing policies and other operators use this information to generate filters for BGP and very often automatically. What we will see in the examples is that there are tools to use that information. For example, BGP Q4 and this then allow us to generate the incoming filters, the filters for the incoming ones. This is a list of the most well-known IRRs. As you can see, most of the regional registers, registries such as ARIN, RIBE, APNIC, they all have their own IRRs. 
and so uh, do it. One of the examples of IRR reg registries are these. This is an example. And this allows us to associate a network prefix with an origin AS. So this is all we need to know, basically. And Route 6 object is 28039910 slash 34. And it says that the origin autonomous system is 64135. Then there is more information that is additional information on who is the maintainer of that object, when this was changed, and something, a couple of more things. But the most important thing is the prefix and the origin AS. And the IRRs have other objects, for example, the odd num, the route, route 6, for IP4 and IP6 routes. In the case of LACNIX IRR, this is a more reduced IRR. It normally works automatically based on the RPKI information. In other IRRs, you generate this information and the autonomous system then records information, this type of information. On the other hand, RPKI is something similar to this, but with a mechanism behind that has to do with a public key infrastructure used to apply for routing purposes. Here we have a different model, LACNIC, or the registries, the regional registries, deliver addresses or resources to the users, to the operators or to the end users, then in addition to giving them resources, they can also provide a digital certificate that demonstrate that that organization has those resources. In that way, the organization which is assigned resources by the registry then can have a way of authenticating that it is that organization that owes those assigned resources. and. In that way, it will be the only organization that will be able to generate and sign objects that affect those resources. So RPKI is based on two parts. One is the ROAs, digitally signed objects. When the organization receives the resources, they receive a digital certificate, and they will have a private key with which they will be able to sign these objects. And the ROAs are no different from what we saw earlier in our in an IRR that were in a route uh, uh, objects, a route six, but the different thing about them is that they are signed. So there are ways you can validate that whoever generated that object, that ROA, that is the association between a prefix and uh, the original uh, autonomous system may not be generated by anybody, but only by the organization that, gener that receives the resources because there is a public and private uh, key system behind it that only the one that received the resource will have the key to sign the ROA. So, IRR, those are the uh, uh, objects. In RPKI, these are the ROAs that are cryptographically signed, and this can be validated. And this is the other part that RPKI has that in IRR was not uh, had not been defined, but in RPKI, they do have a mechanism for validation, the prefixes, the validation of origin. Through this mechanism, what we do is validate that the prefixes we receive uh, through BGP have match the 
declarations that we have in RPKI, either because there's an ROA that covers it or uh, through a different mechanism. All this uh, information is public and it is made uh, uh, visible, uh, available in a rep repository. So we can download it, we can uh, uh, conduct queries, and we can see the R uh, OAs that we have generated. For RPKI, there are two modes of operation. This is important because in the case of I mean, most uh, part of the region, we use the hosted mode, but in Brazil, the delegated mo mode, so or the legacy mode. So when we have the R the PKI of resources, there's a there's an RPKI certificate that is uh, they have it in the regional registry, and with that, they sign. When they assign resources, they sign those uh, resource delegations that are assigned to the operators. But uh, in turn, usually we are in the case that you see at your right. LACNICA provides uh, addresses to the operator and assign those resources. However, in the case of NIC Brazil, LACNIC in turn may somehow delegate that operation to NIC Brazil, and NIC Brazil does the same with their own operators. So they give the, the resources and the digital certificate of those resources, but it's no longer LACNIC that is doing it for the Brazilian uh, operators, but it's NIC Brazil. So that would be the delegated mode in a nutshell. So, as I was saying, in the case of the hosted mode, maintenance is based on the regional registry. In uh, the case of LACNIC, it's me LACNIC, and uh, all uh, the uh, cryptography and the management of the certificates, all that takes place, it's all automated. The certificates are published in uh, the LACNIC's repository, and basically the only thing that the user needs to do is to create and maintain the ROAs, but doesn't have to worry at all about uh, certificate, uh, the certificate authority. We are going to talk about this in the tutorial, but you can see it if you're interested. If uh, even, even if you are not members of LACNIC, you can see it in the tutorial that we're going to have at 11.30 in room one. Mm, that is a, a tutorial on uh, Milaknik. The other is the um, delegated mode. This is what the Brazilian operators use. An organization may opt to have their own certifying authority and may that depends hierarchically of depends on the IRR. Now the organization needs to keep the private keys and the and the uh, company. Uh, keeps the objects. Now, in the case of Brazil, it's Brazil uh, NECBR. It's, it's a very large registry. They have their own operations, and they handle this with a certifying authority that issues all the certificates to all Brazilian operators. But it, it might be of use to other organizations, for instance, organizations that have uh, address spaces from different IRRs. So they may, that enables them to concentrate uh, their operations and they can receive resources from different uh, regional registries. Or large organizations that want to integrate their IP management systems, they use uh, a protocol that's called UpDown that communicates the CA. Uh, the upper CA, the up, upstream with uh, the uh, company uh, down. And you'll see that in an, another tutorial that is going to also to, going to take place at 11.30 in this room. So that you're going to see this in, so this is the delegated mode that you'll see uh, on, at 11.30 in this room. So, you can use software specifically available for this.
So, with this, let's go and see. We didn't want to give uh, too many technical details showing the cryptography of RPKI because we think we thought it would be more useful to know how to use the information because most of you are operators and you won't really be using uh, the other parts of the RPKI. So we were mostly interested in explaining the network operations. And now let me give the floor to Erika again, and she's going to tell us about that. Okay. So, so far we've seen what each of the mechanisms is about, the IRR and the RPKI. We saw IRR as a database that we, where we can conduct queries and find uh, data about registries and we can visualize the routes, the data of uh, the routes announced. Guillermo showed some of uh, the uh, registries that we can see when we sent queries and the RPKI that um, uh, where we are going to give uh, the uh, validity to the routes that we are announcing. So you may have seen that at the end of this tutorial, we're going to complement it with two more tutorials. I'm going to give you further details later. We're going to see some demos and uh, go through some information, and we are going to tell you how the hosted mode works. And you'll have the, the other two tutorials, um, uh, and you'll see the portals where you see the hosted and uh, the delegated mo mode, specifically the latter, that is the one that operates in Brazil. So we're going to see how we could use that information either in the IRR or the RPKI to see what we need to do in our infrastructure. So now we are going to see initially the IRR, and so we have this scenario, this peering scenario. It's a basic peering scenario, an interconnection among uh, two different uh, autonomous systems. Each autonomous system is the owner of IPv4 and IPv6 resources that are announced from 65501, the autonomous system that we have to the right to 65502 and the other way around. These are the two prefixes announced. Now, if we were to send a query to the IRR that is a database from any console, if we use the command there that we showed there, we are going to have the uh, information and we're going to be able to list all the prefixes in IPv6 that we have for that autonomous system. We have the information from the system or the autonomous systems with which we establish connections and we are going to uh, send a query and uh, we can uh, consult any autonomous system outside and from there we'll be able to list the information of the IPv6 and IPv4 prefixes as we see at the bottom. There we have a first cost query, the command that we give the database to know the prefixes that are part of the autonomous system and from there start v validating whether uh, I can learn whether I'm receiving from any route that I don't know what is the autonomous system that uh, is sending it and, and to see whether that it actually belongs to that autonomous system. Then we have an example of transit where we have an interconnection that is a bit, uh, uh, that has more outside members. And in this case, we have 65502, that's the ASN that um, sends the track to the transit to the ASNs here in the right column, 65510, 511, and 509. So in the lower part, we see 
that it says add set. That is a registry that can be created. That's one of the registries that we have in the IRRs where we can tell the other ASNs with whom we are connected what are the internal autonomous systems that they, they're not connected to, we are giving them transit to. So there we are showing the example of the name of the autonomous system of the ad set. We have uh, the transit and the members that are part of that. There you have 65510, 65509, and 65511. Those are the members that we have there to your right. So let's see how we can create that asset and how we can create the registries that we have in the IRRs as an organization, having an autonomous system and having IPv4 and IPv6 addresses, resources, how we can generate that uh, information or where we can get it from to feed the databases so that when we send some queries in uh, this database, we may have that information. So here, we're going to show you an example. Let's see if I can open this. So let's see from Milaknik, the app is a portal where we manage the resources assigned by Laknik from where we could enter and create our registries. Any autonomous system, any organization with, a, and, uh, with an autonomous system may enter here and uh, with uh, a password of the Milaknik. And here we're going to enter with uh, the resources that we have of LACNOG for that example. Now, remember that there are different RIRs globally, but the idea is to have the one developed by LACNIC. And there we are going to understand how to create uh, the asset. Now, I'm going to show you the registries that Guillermo mentioned that are ge generated by this uh, from this IRR, which are the ones that are created automatically. And this, but this asset needs to be created by ourselves to indicate the autonomous systems that we give transit to. And also if we have autonomous system directly connected and we see that uh, information from other autonomous systems is going through our networks, we should know that AS uh, as said information. Now we know that we are receiving this and we have to know where we can allow this information to go on and then which other groups we provide transit outwards. So here we have an image showing how we would create this. Let us enter the Milaknik portal so that we can show you rapidly in detail how this is done. This is where we enter, how we produce the red rec registers, and we'll now explain this and also the resources we have we have assigned and the autonomous sisters for which we wish to generate transit.
So we are changing screens to show you how to access Milaknik. So we're now sharing the browser screen for the remote participants, and now we will see it behind me. Here, what we will now see are the details of the Milaknik system, where we'll be able to generate that register and those that we have uh, created for the Milaknik RIR. So there we are. Thank you. So here we are in Milaknik system. We're using the user we have for Laknog. So we entered www.milaknik, which is where we have the URL, milaknik.laknik.net, and we enter the section over here, services, and there we look for the IRR art. So we click there, and when we enter the RIR, the IRR part, we're going to be able to view the objects. Remember that this is the language in which these policies are generated when we create these records and the IRR. So there we see the types of records we have for LACNIC's IRR. We have ASZ, we have the route, we have the person, the outnum, outnum, and maintainer. And all the route records are created with the information on the RPKI if we generate our ROAS. 
So automatically, those rowers will be updated in the RIR, and those route and route six will be created for IPv4 and IPv6 depending on what D is. We have the person records, autonom, and maintainer, which are automatically generated in the IRR based on the information they have in the who is. And then we have the ASSET record, which is the one that has to be created so that we can see how this should be created. So there we enter the part on ASSET. There you will see we have generated two AS sets which were generated from LACNOG as LACNOG. Can you see that better now? So there we created two AS sets from the autonomous systems assigned by LACNOC 64135 and 64136. These AS sets won't be moved because these are now operational. But we will now look at the information we have over here. Here we see the name that we can assign to the AS set. And the important thing about the AS set, we have to determine which are the members of that connection depending on the types of connections that we have at the level of transit, for example. It, like we were showing in the topology we saw previously. And then through that connection, which are the AS sets that are connected and which receive transit through that connection. So we're going to assign a name so that we can identify this information as well as the AS and that are part of that group of inf set of information that they're sending out. So this gives us the option of eliminating or editing or adding a new AS set. If we wish to add a new AS set, let me show you the information that is then requested. You will note that this is very easy to perform and it describes it, it requests the description, you enter the name, you have to put the AS set for which or from which you are generating that transit. So you will give this a name to identify the connection that we will be using to deliver that transit. And in ASN members, he will be including each of the ASNs who will receive transit. Here we could also use ASs which we created previously, AS sets if they contain information or not, or the ASNs. And then we obtain the list of those that have been already created if we wish to use them again because these are the same members or also if we wish to add anything. So this depends on the information that we can create in ASN members. So we could add those that we already have and that we have created and also add one more when we edit the information. And we could also include some remarks. Once we save the information, the IRR, this information is updated in the database. So when you do a query, in the database, you will be able to visualize that we, as an ASN, for example, ASN 64135, we generated these records for ASNs to which we are providing transit. So you see, we entered the Milaknik system, the user, and for those people who haven't entered the Milaknik system at some moment, let me remind you that there are different types of users if we wish to access this portal. You'll see more about this later on when we have a tutorial later. But there are different types of users. But this information regarding services, and we can see the different options, RPKI and so on, is with the technical level users that has been assigned to us. So this is so that you start trying to find out 
If you wish, you can then access and see the information contained there. But during the demo, the idea is that you help us with our own autonomous system so we can do some queries to see what we can then visualize. This is to create a set. So we can now go on to the back to the presentation. Over here, we see how we can use the BGP Q4 tool, which is another tool that will allow us to do queries and then more specifically to generate filters automatically for our routers so that we can use the ASSET information we have. Let me sh let us show you here what are the commands using BGPQ4. Let me remind you that this presentation is available in the website of the event. In the agenda, you have the link to GitHub where you can download this tool for BGP Q3 or Q4, this tool. So this shows that using the information we have on the AS set, in this case for IPv4 prefixes, this can also generate a prefix list to do filtering in our devices. During the demo, we'll show you this in detail. And we'll do this from the console so you can view it. This we'll do later on. So here, what we put up here is using LACNIX IRR, which I had just shown you, and also the name of the AS set that we generated both for IPv4 and for IPv6. And then we have here the IPv4 prefixes and the IPv6 prefixes that have been allowed so we can generate some type of filtering using this information from the AS set. Now, if we, another option is using filters based on ASPath, ASPath. This could also be done with the BGP Q3 and BGP Q4 tool automatically using LACNIX IRR and also entering the information we have of that AS set that was generated. Can we start with a demo then to look at the details? Why do we prepare the screen? Let's answer a question in the chat that says, Cesar, Cesar Augusto Camacho Sierra says, good morning, could, could I include my uh, transit provider uh, in, um, well, actually, it's a bit rare that it's, it's strange that uh, the transit provider may not give a private, uh, has an, a private ASN. Usually they have public ASN. No, you can't use a private ASN because precisely what we want to publish in an AS set is the public autonomous systems with which we have peering. Because if they were private, the autonomous system might be used in any other by any other organization where the private uh, ones should uh, they should not appear in the internet they should not be available so that shouldn't happen now well what we are going to do here is 
to see what Erika showed in some slides. We publish it for, so that you may have the information. What can we do with the IRR information? The first thing that we can do, for instance, we are going to uh, cons query the IRR of LACNIC with the WHOIS, that's the most basic form, and we are going to send a query on a resource, for instance, ASN 28000, and we, let's see what is the information it gives us. For instance, if we use BG4, if we use that command and we want uh, the IRR of LACNIC and I ask about the autonomous system 28,000, it will give me a, a set of, uh, it generates a list of access where I'm allowing the prefixes in the autonomous system 28,000, in this case, IPv4 prefixes. If I add minus six, this will give me the IPv6 prefixes in autonomous system 28,000. This is the autonomous system that belongs to LACNIC, and these are the prefixes that uh, LACNIC has in IPv4 and IPv6. Notice that what I'm doing here is just I'm not putting anything, and what is generating is a prefix leaks uh, in a serial format. This BGPQ4 command is useful because not only does it have the BGPQ5, but uh, you can also generate these list of access to configure routers with a, a different format. For instance, Juniper, uh, Microtik version 6 and 7, Bird, uh, uh, OpenBSD, OpenBGPD. If you put this same query that I sent earlier, you put minus K7. This would be the Microtik format, minus K7, with the newest version. Notice that here you're generating filters for IPv6 networks with that uh, are in uh, the autonomous system 28,000. We can take, for instance, we can see the AS sets of LACNOG. Erika just showed them. If you enter this command, who is with the LACNIC's autonomous system, well, actually, this is LACNIC's. Well, LACNIC was, uh, what was it? Yes. This is what Erika showed, um, and now I should see the AS set of this autonomous system. In a way, I should use this container to see all of the objects created by this maintain, that is what maintains LACNIC's autonomous system.
What I did here, I don't know whether you saw the query, but again, with the, who is? I queried about uh, uh, the LACNIC. So I, I, I asked for all uh, the objects uh, kept by this maintainer. And there we have the IPv6 prefixes together with the uh, autonomous system of origin. And then in the case of this autonomous system, they don't have any IPv4 prefixes. It's IPv4 only. And the other thing I wanted to use, I wanted to show you the AS set, what Erika showed today with these autonomous systems. The AS set is called AS Lab RPKI Permitidos uh, uh, One. You're going to see this this afternoon. This is an uh, AS set that's used for a lab. And notice that. All the AS sets in uh, LACNIX IRR start with uh, the prefix of the autonomous system that created them. And this is a way we can tell them apart to avoid any overlaps of AS sets or with other autonomous systems. If you named it, this name, you could name it anything. But if you have the same number as another autonomous system, they might overlap. So we proceed with the autonomous system that produced it. And who are the members? These 20,000, uh, 20,001, uh, um, etc. So what we are saying here is, OK, this AS set contains these autonomous systems. Now, what's the meaning of this? Well, it all depends on what we created it for. And we have to somehow report what uh, they're meant for. And here we have the uh, set that Erika showed in the Milaknik portal. You remember that there were two AS sets. Uh, this is the other one. And you're going to see it this afternoon. You're going to see how they use it. But here, too, you have private autonomous systems that are going to be used for the lab. So this would not be a real life use. I don't know whether anybody wants to give us an autonomous uh, uh, number and uh, we can check it here. We can send a query. Maybe you created a set or if you don't know it, you can give us the autonomous system number, and uh, you there we'll see all uh, you've uh, created with time. Anybody in the audience or anybody connected uh, via Zoom? Good morning. Twenty-six six nine zero oh, four. But yes, because I I want to check whether I understood well. Yes, precisely. That's the idea. <laughs> okay. This would be the autonomous system. What we have here, you may see the description. It was generated by uh, Alexander. This uh, by Alcivar Espin, Daniel Alexander, and here by Opticon, you can see the container. If I use this, I can see the objects created by that maintainer. And here, we're going to see here there is an IPv4 route, a route object, 45.162.72.0.22 with and the 
Uh, autonomous uh, system of origin is there, and you have an IPv6 prefix also with this autonomous system. Known, contain, maintainer, and there is no ASS. In this case, what can I do with this? Okay, in this case, it's only two prefixes. But as we saw in the case of LACNIC, there were many IPv4s and IPv6. I could see the entire list of prefixes in each case. For instance, here, I could see all the IPv6 prefixes of this autonomous system. With this command, I'm going, I'm going to see the list of the IPv6 prefixes of that autonomous system. And if I put G, it, it will show me the IPv4 prefixes in this autonomous system of origin. So what this shows, by consulting who is, I could have the IPv6 and IPv4 prefixes of that autonomous system. Do you remember what this is for? I'm going to do peering with autonomous system uh, um, uh, 26, uh, 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 six six two three one oh four and I I want to see what of the prefix they are going to use and I'm going to check it and put these uh, filters at uh, the entry. So when I do peering with uh, with them, I want to use these filters in BGP to only allow this in. How do I do this? Well. I already have the prefixes now, and I can build the AS uh, sets, or or I could do, I can put command BGP Q4, and here I can put the autonomous system 266904. So you can enter a name to the access list. Remember, this is in Cisco format. And directly, what you saw over here, namely the IPv6 prefix we had, is now in the format that I could copy and paste. So precisely, this is what you'll be seeing this afternoon during the automation tutorial, namely how to do this in a more automatic way and not manually. And the same over here for IPv4 prefixes. We also have an example to generate a copy and paste command and generate the access list so that our device, which is Cisco, but if we wish to do it for Juniper or for Microtech, so we can change this like Guillermo is doing now. He changed this to Juniper. He put minus J, and this would deliver the information showing how this command should be created for those types of filters. So all that information will contain the documentation in the link that we have here for BGPQ4, showing how you can vary that command. But this is so that you know that you can also change it depending on the device for which you wish to configure the filter like that. There are also other autonomous systems this is the Zoom. They ask us to verify the 271927 to check that out, that autonomous system. Cesar Camacho. 
over here once again. This, the first thing I do is to check the autonomous system AS and the name of the AS, and based on that, I start obtaining more information. Here you have the technical contact. If we uh, would like to contact the contact here, Lennox generated Otnam. This means it was automatically generated by LACNIC's IRR. And what I take here is this over here. So I'm going to use a command we saw before to do a query to see all the objects created by that maintainer. This contains much more information. Here you have a RAD6 object. This associates a prefix with the origin autonomous system. This is another IPv6 prefix, which is a slash 48. One more over here, one more over here. More over here. And let me check if there's anything else. Well, yes, over here we have an AS set. And that's interesting. Now, what we see over here are all Route 6 objects. I saw no IP4 objects or IP4 routes. And here we have an AS set, which, as you see from the name, it's the prefix. It always begins with AS and the name of the autonomous system, colon, AS, and IPCOM. Here we have two members, 262186 and and it's the original one, 27, 27. So what do we use this AS set for? Well, in principle, we don't know. Here we depend on some additional information. But for example, one of the ways that is normally used to determine which are the autonomous systems to which I provide transit is creating an AS set and then putting that AS set in the DB peering peering DB, which is a database used a lot for peering purposes. And we normally do that. We enter it in the peering DB, and others who wish to connect with us, they know they have to use that AS set in order to obtain information. So if I were to enter here, well, we saw the AS set already. But if I use the BGP command Q4, like we saw just now, and instead of putting the autonomous system number, I put the AS set. Well, what it does here is it takes all the information, it expands the AS set and includes all the AS set included there, as well as all the prefixes. If you wish to do that manually, then what you would have what you would have to do is the following with the AS set. Let's look it up over here and see what prefixes each contains. So I did this here for IPv4. Well, let's see over here. And the other one we had in the AS set, which was 26, 2186. So over here we have all the prefixes from 271927 and 268126. So all these have the prefixes. It checks these out. It checks the route objects contained by this origin AS. So I would have to do this manually and generate the access list. And with a BGP4 command, this can be done automatically. It gets all the prefixes of the autonomous systems for IP4. This is what we already saw. Let's this, take this out and put it for the Cisco format, for example. So if I enter minus 6 in front of it directly, it will show us or it will build 
the list. I put a filter. You can just enter any name, and it will put the permits for the IP6 prefixes. So let us go on. Otherwise, you'll run out of time and want to look at the ROAS part. But basically, this was the idea. You can do this yourselves. You install the command. You do the query. And in the is you have the by default Linuxes. Now, for those of you, we can now validate those for the RPKI part, those who wrote to us in the chat, because we're a bit short of time. So leave those there, and we continue validating these during the RPKI part. These here are the references that contain more detailed information. We have two hours for this tutorial, but this is information that will be useful. This is what we're explaining now, and also so that you have information on the commands that we are using during the demo, and also the tests we conducted. So now, to finish the theoretical part, we were telling you that RPKI, in addition to generating ROAS, as part of the standard, it has the origin validation. And what is all this about? What are we going to see now? The IRRs don't have this, uh, namely how the information of the IRR is done. There is a way to do so, but there is no standard. In the case of RPKI, there is a standard, which is origin, validation of origin. So we saw that this information is published in the repositories. And be, like the regional registries and all those that have delegated mode RPKI, they always so publish the information in their repository. So in the case of LACNIC in its repository, has all the information, all the cryptographic information, all the information on the ROAS, as well as other types of information that allows us to validate this. These are public repositories, so anyone can download this. With an RSync, you could just download it. But Normally, to do so, what we use is a type of software, which is a validating cache. There is public software for this purpose, so we install that in a server in our network, and then we bring LACNIX repository. So we download LACNIX repository, and the software then will conduct the cryptographic validation. So this will give us a whole set of ROAS that pass the validation. What does this mean? There might be ROAS that were injected there or that do not comply with the certificates or with a chain of digital certificates or that have not been included in the resources high up. So this is validated by the validating cache, and we don't need to worry about that. That is what we have the RPKI system for. Now, when that process is completed, we have a list of ROAS. Remember that the ROAS are what we saw in the IRR. It's the same thing. These are prefixes plus the origin AS. So this is going to feed the routers through a protocol called RTR. Now, in our organization, we're going to have a cache validator. We're going to have a server with a validator that could be port, which is the one we will show you. And that validator is going to connect the router with the RTR router and will inform that with the RTR protocol and will inform that list of ROAS. So these are prefixes, autonomous system, and length. 
Now with that, the router will have a way of contrasting the BGP announcement it receives. It will be able to check this. So if the BGP announcement it receives coincides with the ROA information, it will be OK. If it does not coincide, it will be wrong. So this gives us a way to three states of validation, valid, not valid, and not found. This is valid if when we receive a prefix through BGP that coincides with the information stated in the ROA. And the ROA states that the prefix 200, 0, 112, 0, the length, the last 22, a maximum breakdown. I cannot break down further than this. It could be 24, but as a maximum, it could be a 22. And the origin AS. Here I'm using prefixes of validation, and this would be an AS that exists. So once I receive the BGP state, the router checks this against the ROAS. If the ROAS is covered by the prefixes and the maximum length is not greater than the maximum stated there and the autonomous system coincides, then this would be a valid prefix. If it does not coincide because this is not the autonomous system, which is the case of the hijack we saw today that was announcing this from a different autonomous system, if the origin is the one, then this will be considered an invalid one. And if the length is more specific than what I stated, it's also invalid because this could be a case where this could be a route hijack. And why don't we just have valid or invalid? This is because not all organizations have created their ROAs. So this is a topic. Well, this is a reason why we want to promote the adoption of RPKI. Most of the organizations today don't have created ROAs in the resources. So there's a third state which is not found. When you don't have a ROA, you cannot determine whether the prefix is valid or not. So basically, that is the mechanism for origin validation. So now we will look at RPKI in practice. We remind you that uh, in uh, Zoom you can uh, uh, write your questions in the Q&A uh, chat, and it says, Smith Howard says, good morning, Guillermo. I have a question. In the, the AS set is created by the transit provider or the client that also has a public uh, uh, ASM? The asset uh, is created by either the transit creator or uh, it is usually it's used to indicate that the, uh, the autonomous systems that we are going to give transit to. So in this case, it would be created by the transit provider. The ASET for transit, well, actually, the ASET is much more general, and you can create your own for your private use, for your own use within the network, either for documentation or for to generate filters for things that the the ASET is just a set of ASs. It's, it's a grouping of autonomous systems that you decided to use for something. The most common use is to, is to decide who you're going to give transit to, but I can also use it for the autonomous systems that are interconnected in Fortaleza, for instance, or, and others with which I interconnect in Sao Paulo and others in Rio. So I have an AS set for each, and then internally, I can use them in my network. So now the use of AS set, normally if it's to provide transit, it's going to be created my su superior provider that gives me transit. OK, there we have another question by Jonathan Mata that says, I have a question. If I'm given uh, an assign, uh, an ASN IPv6, uh, LACNIC gives me that. Can I publish it, or does 
my provider need to do it? Well, there, Jonathan, the idea is that indeed, if you have an autonomous, if your own autonomous system, you may tell your providers, your transit providers, or your board, your or your internet providers that it is under that autonomous system that you're going to start announcing your resources. In this case, APV6. So if you have your own. Uh, autonomous system that autonomous system is giving is publishing the resources there are many cases in which there are organizations that don't have their own autonomous uh, system but only IPv4 and IPv6 resources and they do the publications under their internet uh, uh, providers or the transit providers so that information is that's what we need to consider for the creation of the IRR and the creation of the ROAs that we need to do in the RPKI part. So if we have our own autonomous system, the idea, Jonathan, is that we should do it by using our own autonomous system, stating that we are publishing it with our own uh, public um, autonomous with the IPv4 and IPv6 uh, resources we have. Let's go on with the RPKI in practice. Here, for the other mechanism, that is the RPKI mechanism. So, let's remember that in RPKI, we no longer speak of the registries as with IRR, but we are speaking of objects that have been signed cryptographically to indicate the right of use of publishing that route. We have the ROAs. If we compare them versus the registries that we saw in the IRR, basically they are equivalent to a route or route six object. So what, is, what information do they associate? They associate the information of a, a prefix, IPv4 to IPv6, to an autonomous system where the route is being originated from where we are publishing it. And with that information, we're going to have a mechanism to check, to validate our BGP table. And when we activate this RPKI, I showed you the validation infrastructure we have where well, we have our routers that receive with the initial routing table, but the routers will connect with a cache uh, server and that will start giving uh, information to my router about the status of validation of the route and that will give me the information of the ROAs that have been informed globally and will connect with the repositories of the different in regional internet uh, registries, the different IRRs in this case, the repository of LACNIC, it will bring information of the ROAs generated and it will deliver it to the routers in our network so that may know it. And in our routing table, we have a new attribute of the routes. It's an attribute that will give us the validity and um, we will see whether the route that we are receiving is valid, invalid, or not found. So who should define these ROAs? All the organizations that have IPv4 or IPv6 resources assigned, this, the creation of these objects can be done through the portal of Milaknik. We are going to see it now very quickly. And uh, you may have seen that it's quite intuitive, quite easy. It's important to see how we make the announcements. Once again, we need username and password to enter the, the portal and to create them. And in the past, the people, those that didn't have their own resources, we know of many organizations that mostly for IPv4, we have some assigned resources that we are being leased by other provider. 
So in the past, if they were reassigned, we couldn't manage them through the portal. We couldn't generate the ROAs, the certificates, for those prefixes that had been sub-assigned. And we depended on the provider that was giving us the resource. But thanks to a policy that was started in April this year, that was approved for this year, in uh, the portal of Melaknik, we can create the ROAs for these sub-assigned blocks. We no longer depend on the providers to do the job, but we can generate the ROAs from the portal and manage them from there. So, as I mentioned earlier, there may be organizations with no autonomous number uh, but if they have IPv4 and IPv6 uh, resources, we need to know how we are making the announcements. So what is the autonomous system, for instance, the, in the upstream provider to consider that information, how we are announcing our IPv4 and IPv6 prefixes and from which autonomous system we are generating them. So there we should allow the ASNs that are publishing our information to have the right to publish those routes. In this case, in the creation of these uh, ROAs is different from what do we would do in the RIR, big IRR because here it's created by uh, the one that has the resource, the IPv4, IPv6. It's different from IRR, where the registers are created by the owner of the ASN. So that's the difference between the two mechanisms. So we need to, cons what are the uh, main I things that we need to consider when we create the ROAs, how we are communicating the prefixes. In this case, we have an IPv4 network, a 22 prefix. If we are publishing this prefix summarized, or we are publishing the entire block, 22, or we are uh, de breaking it down, for instance, in 24 prefixes, how are we publishing it? And from which autonomous system is the route being generated? These are the two principles that we need to bear in mind to create our array. Always bear in mind how we are well, publishing the um, these prefixes through the autonomous system or through different autonomous systems. So that's something that we need to uh, be taken into account. And it's a policy that we need to respect not to disable our publications, not to invalidating our public. If there, there, you remember that there were three states, valid, invalid, and not found. Not found or unfound is when we didn't find um, the, set, the ROA suffer. So we have a network that is validating. Our routes are going to be seen as unfound. So there, in many networks, those unfound networks are not filtered. We know they are not malicious, but we don't have the details of how they're being published. However, if we don't respect this principle of indicating the autonomous system for which we are publishing a route correctly, or how we are publishing it, we can invalidate our announcement, and it may appear in the validation table as an invalid route, and it is there that that route that we are publishing can be filtered, and that may affect that part of routing at a global level. Where can we create this? Well, we create this from the Milaknik system. In the service part, we'll have the space to create the ROAs, and we can do it step by step. Once again, well, here there are some tools that are in the links that we showed you, that we gave you in the presentation, these are tools that we can use to validate how we're making the announcement. And based on that, we'll generate the ROAs. So tools like InfoRedis, for instance, or monitor, uh, Fort Monitoring, we're going to see it later on. That's a validation software that we'll install in the server. And these tools can be um, you can consult in the web and 
you can see how we are publishing things. And from there, you can get detailed information so that you can uh, learn how to uh, create your ROAs. Well, we don't have, it's, we're rather short of time. Still, we're going to do this and see how we create it. The idea is to enter Melaknik services. We won't enter the IRR segment, but RPKI. And there you will be given a choice to create the ROAs. The only thing that, the only information that they will ask us is the autonomous system we are originating from and the prefix that we are publishing through that AS. So there we'll be able to uh, enter it, we save it, and there we start seeing it uh, among the ROAs that we have created for the different autonomous systems. If we have different autonomous systems, we can create the ROAs for each autonomous system and to list them, not having to do them step by step, but you put the autonomous system and you put the segments that we are publishing through that day, yes, and from there on, automatically they're all created. I don't know whether you can see this. It's rather small, but well, the platform is quite intuitive. And when we generate the ROAs, we'll see the information of the segments that we have created, uh, all of the autonomous systems we have there. And we're also going to have a preview telling us the current status of the ROAs that we created, whether they are valid, uh, not valid or unfound. So very quickly, let's see the RPKI part. To see the validators that can be used for the validation of origin. So let's put up the lab on the screen. What I have here is a virtual machine with a forge validator which has already been installed. I will rapidly now show you how we can check the rowers if they have a validator. This validator is installed. I won't go into the details of the different options. You can check this out in the Ford information contained in the presentation. Now, what I did here was to write that the result of this validation should also be shown in addition to the RTR that it should generate a CSV file containing the rowers. One is has gone through the validation, so then all the rows will be included in a CSV file. So I can do queries there. Let's look at the rowers of 28,000 Milaknik rowers, and then one we received in the Q&A. So let me first show you how ROAS.CSV, it is a CSV file, which are files separated by commas. You have the autonomous system, the prefix, the maximum length, and that is the information you will have. You see here, you have an autonomous system, the prefix, and the maximum length. It's 18, maximum 24. And there are lots and lots. These are all the ROAs. If you look at the amount of created ROAs, when I run the validation, we had 463,425 ROAs. It's 400,000 ROAs, almost 500,000 ROAs. So what I can now see Instead of looking at each of the rowers one by one, I can look up one specifically. For example, I'm going to look up from autonomous system 28,000 and I put a comma. 
So we only have those. And this now shows me that this is LACNIC's autonomous system number. I have all the rows created by LACNIC's administrator. Here we have all the IPv4 addresses and IPv6 addresses. This one over here, for example, is a slash 22 prefix and maximum disaggregation of 22, maximum broke, broken out to 22. If you have a 24, it will be considered invalid, even if it's from the 28,000 AS. So if at LACNIC I decide to publish a slash 24 for this prefix, 201, 219.252.0 slash 24, that would be invalid unless I modify this row. And the same happens with the rest. Here we also have IPv6 prefixes where the maximum disaggregation is 48. And you can see that. Now let, let us have a look at another autonomous system, which is the one we received here. 52420. And here we have a row for this prefix. 2803-8900-32, maximum disaggregation of flash 48. And then 1, 2, 3, and 4 IPv4 prefixes to slash 19 and slash 20 with maximum disaggregation slash 24. So bear in mind here, this one that is a 19, maximum disaggregation 24 is covering all the options for announcements. Maybe it is covering more than what is necessary, but this guarantees that they will not make a prefix invalid one that you are publishing. Now, basically, what you have to check is what Erica was telling us, how you are publishing your announcements in the internet, and that when you create the rows, these have been done in the same way. And if you're going to change the way you publish your announcements, whether you change your autonomous systems or you do most, more specific publishes, remember to change the row, otherwise you're going to be invalidating your prefixes. Validators. Well, this is what we wanted to show you in the demo, and we'll finish with the available validators, Erica. So can we go back to the presentation, please? So let's go over to the validation part. Guillermo was showing you a while ago when we looked at the validation infrastructure that we saw over here these validators caches, which are the local servers we have in our infrastructure. There we will install a software which is the software I will be referring to, the validation software, and that software will be the one that will be delivering information to our routers where we have the software will deliver these rowers. The software will then connect, depending on how you configure it, uh, with the frequency we determine, and then we'll be updating the information contained in the repository of the internet registries, which has all the rows that are created for all the prefixes. So this is brought locally to the validator. The validator then submits this information with a given frequency so that the BGP table that we have, the routing table, then contains that additional attribute of the validation status of all the routes that we are learning. So that is why it's so important that when we have configured our routers with connections to our external peers, we know the entire route and you don't have a default route because that way would not be able to view that information. So that is also one of the best practices that we have to implement. So the validators are, is that software that we can install in the ca validated cache available locally in our network and depending on the type of network, 
that we have. And this will imply having our own validation scheme or also to generate the rowers in order to contribute to validation globally. So this is uh, available validation software, one of the first validators that started to be used for RPK validation is the one developed by RIPE NCC. This software is no longer maintained as from July 2021, but it was one of the first available validators. At present, we have many validators. You see here the names Octo, RPKI, and GoRTR, which are developed by Cloudflare. These validators are used a lot for content provider networks. We have Routinator 3000, which are validator software developed by MLNet Labs. These are versions that have different features. And here we highlight the most important of these features of the different software options. This is open source software. If you wish to have your validation infrastructure in open source software, you can decide which one you wish to use. Let me comment that Routinator 3000, there is a person from NLNet Labs here at the event, and they will be present at the next tutorial on the delegated mode RPKI. He is a person who developed the large part of this and also Krill. So please take advantage of the fact that he is here and you can meet him because he's one of the persons who developed this software. Thank you. During the event, we'll also be around if you wish to ask specific questions on what we have seen. So we'll be around the entire event. We also have the fourth validator, which is the one Guillermo showed rapidly during the demo. Fort is a validator developed by LACNIC and NIC Mexico. This is a, quite an efficient validator developed in C, so it allows you to have this validation software locally in order to validate information against the RPKI repository that internet registries have and then use it for the purpose of routing configuration and resolution. So here in the presentation, we include the link for the general documentation of the Ford Validator and also the link if you wish to download this, it is open software. And then it shows you the resources you have to have in your system to see if you can download this software. And then you can have lots of more information contained in those two links. Now let us look at some of the useful tools that can be used to monitor the status of our route. You will recall that as owners of the IPv4 and IPv6 resources, we are responsible for generating these types of digital certificates such as a ROA. So it is important to up these, update these. If this route or if this segment, for example, the prefix 19 that we have is then being segmented once again into larger or smaller prefixes, then we have to update all that information in, our, in the rowers we created. Because if we start announcing these to new autonomous systems, this also has to be updated. We have then these tools that support us to, in order to monitor the status of the RPKIs and will be sending us notifications to, to our email addresses regarding the status of our states. And if we're changing the validation of our routes, then these are tools that are free to use. And depending on the type of information that we wish to visualize, then we'll be able to use some of these. We have BGP Alerter, which is a platform that can be used for monitoring. You have to install it. It is an open source tool, as I was saying, but we have to download it and install it. 
Then we have a packet VIS does not require installing it. This can be done through the web, and you have to state the email address where you wish to receive information. So we receive the notifications and updates by email whenever we change the status of the rowers that we generated for our routes. But then you have also information, and we will have, during the event, Massimo Candela, he is a person who developed these tools, so you will be able to ask him specific questions on this topic and regarding these tools. You also have several tools here that will be useful to validate how you're making the announcement of your routes, how you're going to generate the rowers. We have InfoRedis, Fort Monitoring. These are all tools that you can use to see how you're publishing the information and how you have to create the rowers. And then you have others that show you how you can do the route, show the routing information, the route RIS that shows you the status of these mechanisms. Thank you very much. We didn't have so much time, but as I said, we'll be around during all week. If you have any specific questions this afternoon, we have a tutorial on automation, and we will look into these aspects regarding RPKI. It will be great. We're going to have quite an interesting lab. So you will be able to see more information on route hijacking, how this can be visualized, and how can we stop this. So we also invite you to participate in all the different tutorials we'll be having throughout the day. So to close, let's go back one slide. I want to refer to the campus. Okay, there we are. One of the things that is important is that there is a campus course in LACNIC. Erika is one of the facilitators. And there we touch upon these two topics. We see BGP and RPKI and RIR. IRR, sorry, and this began this year. So this has to do with the specialization activities of LACNIC's campus. This year we had the first edition, it already finished, but for next year we're going to have several editions and you will be informed about the dates when these courses will be opened. We'll have many more tools and much more details further to what we heard over the past two hours. And this has to do with the advanced management of BGP and these two mechanisms, IRR and RPKI. LACNIC's booth is available. You have the people uh, from LACNIC's campus in the afternoon. Mariela will be there, who is in charge of campus LACNIC. So if you have any questions regarding the course and how to register, please feel free to contact us at LACNIC's booth. Like Erica is saying, the booth is there available. You can check out the information on the campus, on the FRIDA program, and many other topics, for example, policy development and so on. So now we will have a break. The break is until 11.30. We resume at 11.30 in this same room with VGP routing security, RPKI in delegated mode, and, and CRIL. This is great for those who are members of NIC.br because this is what Brazil uses. And let me remind you that one of the people who developed CRIL will be there. So really, you have the opportunity of contacting that person. So thank you very much, Erica for supporting me with this tutorial. And let me also remind you that we'll be around this afternoon. This afternoon will be in the tutorial on automation. And during the week, you can get in touch with us to obtain further information. Thank you. The pending questions in the Q&A received by Zoom will be then answered through the Zoom too. Thank you very much for your participation.